In this video, we're going to look at some CMOS charge pump circuits for integrated circuit phase lock loops. First, just a reminder of where charge pump circuits fit into integrated circuit PLLs. Here's just a generic block diagram of a phase lock loop. In so-called charge pump phase lock loops, charge pump circuits arise as critical components in this part of the loop. Generally, the phase detection in such phase lock loops provides logical signals that indicate whether the clock phase is early or late. These are labeled here pull up and pull down signals because of their impact on the control voltage that's applied to the VCO. So these logical signals are generally applied to switches in a so-called charge pump. These switches close and direct some current from the charge pump into the subsequent loop filter, either into it or out from it, depending on the polarity of the pull up and pull down signals. So since the pull up and pull down signals are only active for a narrow window of time, you can think of these switched current sources as depositing quantities of charge onto the loop filter or taking quantities of charge off of the loop filters, hence the name charge pump. It turns out the design of these current sources and switches are really critical because any non-idealities there translate into uh, changes in the control voltage applied to the VCO and therefore have a direct impact on the phase of the recovered clock at the output of the phase lock loop. Here's a very simple implementation of a CMOS charge pump circuit developed in the mid 90s. So some nice things about this circuit are that they it presents a similar load to both the pull up and pull down inputs. The assumption here is that we have complementary versions of these inputs available and they're both applied to differential pairs. Uh, this current mirror here ensures that current is either directed towards the output VO or drawn away from it, depending on the polarity of these pull up and pull down signals. The assumption is that only one of these pull up or pull down signals are active at a time. Now a significant drawback of this simple circuit is that its output resistance is not very high. So imagine that this PMOS transistor is activated and sourcing some current to the output from VCC. Well, in that case, we would assume that this path down here is turned off and the output resistance of the charge pump circuit would simply be RDS of a single PMOS transistor. Although that might be relatively high in an older technology, in modern technologies with short channel lengths, RDS can be relatively low. And there's an important problem with that. It means that the current sourced by this PMOS transistor depends very much on the voltage that uh, arises here at the output. Now you can imagine when the PLL is in lock, this output voltage may be at a high voltage or a low voltage, depending on what else is going on in the PLL. What's the temperature of the VCO? What process corner is this integrated circuit fabricated at? And so on. So what it means is that the pull up and pull down current depend on the charge pump output voltage, something like this plot. And the worst part is they vary in opposite ways. So if the output voltage is high, this PMOS transistor will source less current, but when active, this NMOS current source will source more current. Whereas when VO is low, this pull down path will, will sink less current and the pull up path will source more current. So you get a, a plot like this one where we plot output voltage for the pull up and pull down paths as a function of the output voltage. Now at the extreme voltage is very close to ground or very close to the supply voltage. One or the other of the current paths will stop working properly. The transistors will enter triode and the currents will vary drastically. So the assumption is that the output voltage is limited within a certain range between the supply voltage and ground. But even within this range, unfortunately, the pull up and pull down currents are not precisely matched. And again, this is a direct consequence of the finite output resistance of these current sources. So a straightforward improvement would be to use current sources with enhanced output impedance. And here's an example of a circuit like that, 
you see that the pull up and pull down currents are cascode current sources. So here's the cascode biasing for the PMOS transistors. Here's the cascode biasing for the NMOS transistors. And you'll see here that the inputs to the charge pump, the logical inputs pull up and pull down, are applied to these switches here. When pull up is active, the bias voltage is applied to the gate of MP2 and current is sourced from VDD. When pull down is active, the bias voltage is applied to MN1 and current is sunk from the output. So we've got a higher output resistance, but still there will be a finite RD, uh, R out for this charge pump circuit. And there will be some therefore mismatch between the pull up and pull down currents that depends on the output voltage. Now, in the presence of such mismatches between the charge pump pull up and pull down currents, you essentially have an input output relationship for the charge pump phase detector as shown here. So here's a plot of phase error between the reference clock and the VCO clock, or a divided version of the, ref of the VCO clock on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, the average current coming out of the charge pump averaged over many clock cycles. So you would expect that with more phase error, you would have positive current coming out of the charge pump. And with more negative phase error, you'd have more negative current coming out of the charge pump. But because of this mismatch, the relationship is nonlinear. There's a kink in the relationship right here at zero phase error. So this makes the, this sort of invalidates the linear or the linear analysis of the phase lock loop. And whenever you introduce a nonlinearity like that, it's not surprising that tones may arise. So specifically what you see in the phase noise at the output of the PLL in the presence of such a nonlinearity is the appearance of spurs, that is tones in the phase noise spectrum where jitter is concentrated at specific frequencies. One way you might understand that is to imagine that, you know, because there's in this case, larger pull down current than pull up current, you can imagine that a single pull down current is going to require multiple pull up current pulses to cancel it. So you can imagine you might get sort of periodic patterns of a single pull down current followed by multiple uh, pull up currents to counteract it. And, and that, you know, so perhaps not surprisingly, such a characteristic gives rise to uh, spurs or tones in the phase noise of the output of the PLL. Now, as is often the case with nonlinearities, a rigorous analysis of this effect is uh, very difficult um, and doesn't provide a lot of intuition, especially for beginners. So, uh, but, in, but hopefully you can uh, accept that these spurs will arise in the presence of such mismatch, and also that uh, this is undesirable in many applications. So here's an improved charge pump circuit based on current mirrors originally presented in this 2000 Electronics Letters article. And it essentially makes use of a replica biasing technique. So to see how this works, recognize that this node here is the output of the charge pump. And you've got a feedback loop here formed by the amplifier and the transistor M6. And assuming that that feedback loop is compensated so that it's stable, what you end up with is that the voltage at this reference node is equal to the voltage at the output of the charge pump. Because if that loop is stable, we expect to see a virtual short circuit between this amplifier's input terminals. So in order for that to be the steady state situation here, it will have to be the case that I2 equals I3. And you'll notice that the transistors M5 and M6 are sourcing uh, a replica or copy of the pull-up current that will arise through the branch M1 and M2. Similarly, M7 and MA are a replica current source that replicates the pull down current that flows in M3 and M4. So that's why I call this a replica biasing technique. 
And essentially, it ensures that the pull up and pull down currents remain the same regardless of the voltage of VREF and hence regardless of the voltage of CP out. The way I think of it is that the feedback loop ensures that VREF is a copy of the output voltage and it adjusts the gate voltage of M6 to be whatever it needs to be to ensure that I2 is equal to I3. And that, as long as you've got good matching between these transistors, therefore I1 and I4 are equal. Now keep in mind, all this implies is that the pull up and pull down currents are equal regardless of the output voltage. It doesn't mean that they stay the same across all output voltages. So the situation is depicted here on this plot. Here we see that the current through the pull up and pull down paths represented by the solid black line and the dashed line exactly lie on top of each other over a wide range of voltages at the output of the charge pump. But the current's not exactly the same. It is changing as a function of current. It's just that the pull up current will constantly adjust itself to match whatever the pull down current is. So as we expect, the pull down current increases with increasing output voltage. And it's just that in this case, because of the feedback that the pull up current tracks it across the full range. So what you still have is a situation where the PLL loop dynamics vary depending on what the voltage is here. Uh, so things like the loop gain, uh, loop bandwidth will depend on the lock point, the voltage at which the PLL rests in lock here. But at least you won't have that nonlinearity, which gives rise to spurs. Another non ideality in charge pump circuits that can cause problems in PLLs is charge injection. Because you're constantly turning current sources on and off via switches, somewhere you've got transistors whose channel regions are being vacated of charge when they turn off and then being repopulated with charge when the switches turn on again. So that charge has to come from somewhere. And inevitably, some of it will be uh, coming to and from the output of the charge pump, which is causing glitches at the output of the charge pump, which in turn causes glitches in the phase at the uh, output of the VCO. So here's a design that tries to mitigate the impact of charge injection in a charge pump. You see you've got cascode current sources uh, drawing a constant current and sourcing a constant current. And rather than turning the current sources on and off, their current is simply being directed alternately between the output of the charge pump or uh, alternately to a dummy node over here labeled NB. Now, to provide as good matching as possible between these two possible paths of current, a unity gain buffer here labeled UB makes the node voltages at NB a copy of whatever voltage arises at the output of the charge pump. So this ensures quite good matching between these two paths. The intention is that when the complementary switches here turn off, these ones will in turn turn on. So any charge injected by these transistors will be soaked up by these transistors and have minimal impact at the output of the loop filter. Likewise, you've got complementary switches in the pull down path as well. All these techniques, of course, rely on good transistor matching.